Well, good evening and uh, welcome to our Christmas Eve by candlelight service here at the Tron Church. There is a, a creche for young children just halfway down the stair there, and so please do feel free to make use of that. And uh, do stay behind afterwards. We'll have some refreshments downstairs, an opportunity to uh, share that time together. Well, the Christmas message is nothing less than that in Jesus Christ, our world has seen the unique, indeed the ultimate revelation of God to man. And so our service tonight begins not on earth, but in heaven with God himself, because our story is about God, but not a distant God. A God who in the coming of Jesus Christ became Emmanuel, became God with us as the Savior and indeed as the restorer of his people. He came down to earth from heaven, who is God and Lord of all. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man 
in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it, to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That's a wonderful picture of the world as it's meant to be, the world as God created it to be. And of course, of the world as we would love it to be. Perfect peace and harmony, male and female, mankind and nature, man and God. No wonder the next carol tells us to praise our creator God. But notice when we come to the last line of the carol, it tells another story. We praise God who has made heaven and earth of naught, yes, but also because he with his own blood mankind has bought. And after the next carol, the next reading will begin to explain why that has to be so. <laughs>
Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God For go but the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. A curse upon human relationships, a curse upon nature, and a curse on our very lives. To dust you shall return. And that is more like the world we actually know. And it's because our rebellion against God has put us in bondage. Through the fear of death, people are subject to lifelong slavery, is how the Bible puts it. But you heard God's promise there, even as that curse was pronounced, that evil would not have the last word. That God himself would intervene in history through the offspring of the woman who would at last destroy the work of the devil and at last liberate and restore his people. And down through history, that promise shone brightly despite long ages of darkness until at last at the first Christmas, that promised offspring came to save us all from Satan's power when we had gone astray.
Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, or his ear dull, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wickedness. No one enters suit justly, no one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas, they speak lies, they conceive mischief and give birth to iniquity. Their works are works of iniquity, and deeds of violence are in their hands. Their feet run to evil, they are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their highways. The way of peace they do not know, and there is no justice in their paths. They have made their roads crooked. No one treads on them, knows peace. Therefore, justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, and behold, darkness, and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. Well, that was fairly grim reading, but not from yesterday's newspaper, although it perhaps could have been, but actually from the prophet Isaiah speaking some eight centuries before the birth of Christ. And he was describing the world of his own day, which is remarkably similar to our own contemporary world. And of course, the truth is that human beings haven't actually changed that much in about 3,000 years. So we mustn't dismiss the Bible as ancient history. It isn't. It could not be more relevant for our world and our society today. How great is the world's need for saving? Saving from the darkness of our own humanity. But because of the message of Christmas, out of darkness we have light. And that's why on Christmas night, all Christians sing. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. 
and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. In that day, the Lord, with his hard and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then shall the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Isaiah the prophet again, that man who saw so clearly the bitter truth of the world of humanity as it really is. So how can the same person possibly believe that one day sorrow and sighing will flee away and instead there will be everlasting joy? Well, because God had promised that at last one would arise, the promised seed of the woman, the branch from King David's line, who would be the savior to restore all things. And in this coming one, as Isaiah said, your God will come and save you to banish darkness and evil, to make sorrow and sighing flee away forever, and to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. And that's why Christmas is indeed a message of joy to the world. Isaiah promised that God himself would intervene one day to restore all things, that his own arm would bring salvation. 
And Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, tells us how that was actually fulfilled. Writing to Titus, he says, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared in the person of Jesus Christ, he saved us. Listen to this brief reading from Titus chapter 2. The apostle says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works." We're going to think together this evening for a few minutes about what that means. But before we do that, we're going to sing once again a carol that reminds us why heaven and earth sang for joy at Jesus' birth. Now above the heavens are ringing. Saints, their longing turn to singing of the Christ, their rescue bringing. Praise with them, our Savior King. I want to focus this Christmas Eve on these words from Titus chapter 2, where the apostle tells us that in Christ's coming, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And he says it means that uh, he gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. What the Apostle Paul is telling us here is that Jesus Christ came into this world to bring a legacy as the ultimate restorer of beauty to our humanity. That's one very important way of of, of looking at what the Bible means by salvation. The Bible is a book all about God's salvation. It comes to its climax in the birth and the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the question is, what is salvation? It's a vital question, isn't it, whether you're a Christian believer or not. And surely it's a worthwhile subject for us to think about for a few minutes this Christmas Eve before we go home and get the turkey ready, hang up the stockings, try and get the children into bed before they wake you up at goodness knows what time tomorrow morning. It's worth knowing, I think, isn't it, what Christmas is meant to be about. Even if it's only to know, well, why you don't want to make it for you, why you want to reject it. 
Honest people, open-minded people want to do that, don't they? They want to understand the truth about what they're thinking about. Well, here's a, a succinct little verse from Christ's apostle that gives us one way of looking at this whole question of, of salvation. He says here in Titus that God's salvation is the story of humanity being rescued from grim lawlessness and to glorious life by the great liberator, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born into this world at that first Christmas. And Paul says he gave himself, and he means, of course, when he died on the cross at Calvary, that was the destination of his mission right from the very beginning. He says he gave himself to restore us from the blight, from the brokenness of human life as we know it, without God, to the boundless beauty of human life with God. That's what he says here. Christmas is all about the, the ultimate restoration of beauty to human beings. It's as big as that. Let me try and talk you through it. First of all, let's focus on what the Bible might call the bondage of man's grim lawlessness. Lawlessness, says Paul, is what Christ came to redeem us from, to rescue us from, to liberate us, to set us free from. So lawlessness, that is ignoring God's law, that is not the path to freedom, according to the Bible, but to bondage. In fact, the Apostle John defines sin as lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness, he says. No, it is not lawlessness is sin. That's true as well, of course. But rather what he's saying is that the very meaning of the heart of sin is lawlessness. And that's why it's such a serious and a destructive thing, a fearful thing. Think of the scenes of lawless chaos that we've seen just recently in TV reports of France with the, with the yellow jacket movement. It's quite frightening, isn't it? People have died on the roads in France. There's been anarchic chaos. The rule of law has been thrown off and it leaves people imprisoned. It doesn't liberate people. It leaves them afraid to go out. It leaves them fearful on the roads. It leaves them captives to fear. Well, how much greater the fearful chaos and the captivity when it is God's rule that is overthrown and rebelled against. But that is the story of humanity according to the Bible. As you know, the Bible story begins in Genesis, in Eden, with a, a picture of mankind living peacefully under God's rule. We heard it. Kept safe, kept, kept healthy by God's good and perfect law. But then comes man's great fall. And the beautiful rule of a sovereign God is exchanged for the baleful reign of selfish humanity. Actually, the word fall, that is not how the Bible describes it. Almost as if it could be accidental. But it was far from accidental. Writing to the church in Rome, Paul says that man trespassed, that we transgressed, that it was ranked disobedience to God. It was nothing less than rebellion, than revolution against God and against God's rule, against God's law. And so, as he says, human beings became slaves to iniquity and lawlessness. Note that, slaves. If you replace God's rule with your own self-rule, it leads not to liberty, but to bondage. Not to the way of liberating beauty, but to the way of lawless blight and brokenness. People tend to think of the, the book of Genesis as just ancient history and irrelevant to us, but in fact, it's just full of the story of human life as we know it to be still today. It's full of the same things that you read about in the papers and you watch on reality TV. Genesis chapter 4 onwards tells us about the downward spiral of human lawlessness. It begins, as you know, with the famous story of Cain and Abel. It just epitomizes the, the personal effects when you turn your back on God's rule over your life. You start turning your back then on your fellow human beings as well in self selfishness and, and in self-preservation. You know the story, Cain was, was jealous of his brother Abel. He hated him and then eventually he killed him. He separated himself from God's rule and he became his own ruler in life. But did it, make it, did it make him happy? Of course it didn't. 
Did it liberate him? Far from it. In fact, Cain says, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Why? Well, because he's cut himself off from God's rule over his life. And so he's lost his whole sense of identity. You've driven me away from the ground and from your face I shall be hidden, he says. He's lost all sense of what he's created for and who he's created for. For God and for work for God. And so he's lost also his whole sense of society. I'll be a fugitive wherever I go on the earth, he says. So his relationship's disappointment. He's restless. Can't find peace. And as a result, he's got no sense of security any longer. Whoever finds me, says Cain, is going to kill me. So his life is governed by fear of the future, fear of people, fear that people will hurt him. He can't trust anybody, can't trust to commit himself to anybody else, any people in relationships, or indeed in business or commerce or anything else. Is that ancient history? I don't think it is. Because our world is full of canes in the 21st century, isn't it? Full of people with very little sense of identity or of society or of security. See, this world of, of relational holocaust that we live in, with its swathes of breakdown and of bitterness and of blight, that is the world of lawlessness. It's the world that has rebelled against God's rule, against the gracious, good rule of our Creator. That's why there's fear, that's why there's uncertainty all around us this Christmas time, whether it's Brexit fears, whether it's a loss of trust in Parliament or in the government, whether it's the crisis in trust that seems to be breaking out all around the world and, and fueling tensions in so many countries in the world today. There is a reason for the way the world is. And the Bible says, yes, it is a curse. You human beings in rejecting God's rule, you've put yourself in bondage to lawlessness in bondage to that autonomous self-rule. And that, says the Bible, is the cancer that's at the root of all the symptoms of, of disease and distress that we experience in human society today. You know, the symptoms and the signs of cancer, they can often seem quite unrelated, can't they? But to the trained eye, they can be signs just in the hands or in the eyes or in the face or in the bones, or even in the brain. And they can all be traced back to that primary malignancy deep within the body. And the Bible writers are just like that, astute physicians that pinpoint the diagnosis of what's wrong with the whole world. All the restless anxieties in our lives, all the unsettled longings, all the frustration, the despair, the grief, all of these things that, that stalk our human lives here on earth. All our sense that, that life is just so much less than we imagined it would be. It's all due to the cancer deep at the heart of our human story that brings disease and in the end that brings death to our existence. This lawlessness that right at the very heart of our human nature and it's the rejection of God's sovereign rule over us. And we imagine ourselves to be our own gods. We imagine that we're ruling ourselves. But the truth is, friends, that has led our world into disaster. Hasn't led, has it, to, to great beauty and purpose in our human lives. Hasn't led to fruitfulness and fulfillment. So often it's led only to pollution, to blight, to lives that are futile and fruitless. As human beings, we've said, we will rule ourselves. We will not have God's rule over us. And God has said, all right, have it your way and do it your way if that's what you want. The Bible says God has, has given human beings up to our own foolish desires. And friends, the result of that is the world all around us, the evidence of our own eyes and our ears the world that we have made through our own human wisdom. We've refused to live as God's creation, as God's possession, and instead we've insisted on self-possession. And the result is the world we live in. 
Humanity rejected God and reaped not great life, but death. Not majesty, but mortality. And that's the Bible's diagnosis of of why life on earth is as it is, as it really is, not as we wish it were. It's a life and it's a whole world that's in bondage to grim lawlessness as a rejection of our sovereign God. And yet the Apostle Paul says that despite all this, God who is the rejected sovereign has become God our Savior. And that Jesus Christ came into the world to redeem us from grim lawlessness and for glorious life. That's what it means that at the first Christmas, through the birth of Jesus Christ, the grace of God appeared, bringing salvation. He's come to redeem us for the beauty of God's glorious life. Paul says Christ came to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good, to restore them from lawless blight to the liberating beauty that we were made for from life that was so much less now than we imagined it could be to a life that is abundantly more than we could ever, ever imagine, forever and ever. Purify. That's a word used of the refiner of precious metals who has to get rid of all the dross to make it shine again magnificently and beautifully. But it's also a word that's used in a more personal way of the Lord Jesus himself when when he purified and cleansed lepers during his earthly ministry. Lepers were soiled, they were impure. And therefore, as a result, they were separated, they were isolated, excluded from participation in normal human society as it should be. And that's Paul's point here. Sin and its lawlessness pollutes us. It, It soils our lives. And it separates us, it excludes us from the true humanity that we were made for. And for the true life that can only be had in real fellowship with God himself. It leaves us in our life of self-possession, in in floundering, fruitless, futility and mortality. But he is saying that Jesus Christ came to restore us to God's possession where we truly belong. To a true life of flourishing of fruitful fulfillment of life that truly is everlasting. So that just as as sin's polluting cancer blighted our whole lives in, in countless ways, not just our deeds, but our words, even the thoughts that shame us. So Christ's purifying cleansing will beautify every aspect of our humanity now that we belong to him, that we're his possessions, so that all that we do and all that we are can be and will be good and wholesome and lovely and true, and we will never have to be ashamed of ourselves ever again. Of course, that full fruit of our salvation is not yet ours. The Bible's very clear about that. Paul is explicit here. He said, didn't he, that we're waiting for our blessed hope, the appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Only then will we be fully restored when, as Paul says elsewhere, we also will receive our resurrection bodies like him. And when we will see him as he truly is and we will be like him. But already, Paul is telling us that the first sunbeams of that glorious new day for our world are here in the coming of Christ our Savior to redeem us His grace is already transforming those who have thrown themselves on him. Training us, he says, to live even now in this present life with godly lives as we wait for that great day. That great day will fulfill all that the prophet spoke of. When the desert will bloom like the rose. When the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf unstopped. When the lame will leap like a deer when the tongue will sing for joy and everlasting joy will be upon the heads of God's people. That day is coming. The Bible is quite clear when the full glory of God our Savior is revealed. And it's certain because 
the grace of God our Savior has already appeared in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that first Christmas. That's why we sing, strikes for us now the hour of grace, Savior, since thou art born. The very last prophet of the Old Testament, Malachi, promised of a coming day that would be the rising sun of righteousness for our world. It would rise with healing in its wings. And that's exactly what the Christmas message means. Nothing less than the first rays of dawn of that promise. And it's already begun. That's what John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, sang about as he anticipated the birth of Jesus. Because of the tender mercy of our God, he says, the sunrise will visit us from on high in the birth of Christ to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. See, the light of, of heaven's grace and mercy that purifies all that leads only to human darkness and death. It opens the way to peace with God and everlasting. It's come in the person of Jesus to lead us from pain and into ultimate peace and from blight and the brokenness of our grim lawlessness to the brightness and the beauty of God's glorious life. And that's the message that Christmas sings to our broken world, to every human being within it. The grace of God has appeared in the person of the Savior, Jesus Christ, to purify for himself a people to be restored to the beauty of life as God meant it to be. It's a message of glorious possibility for every kind of possible human need, for the heartbroken, for the grieving, for those who are burdened with guilt, with shame in their lives, for the lonely, for the unwanted, for those who have failed and disappointed others, perhaps most of all for those who have failed and deeply, deeply disappointed themselves. Jesus Christ is the gracious and glorious restorer of human beings. He came to bring back the beauty into our lives to purify everything that's soiled and spoiled, everything that's shameful, everything that's sorrowful. And out of the ashes of even the most burnt out wrecks of human life to bring forth the promise of a new day, a day that will swallow up every last vestige of the poor and pathetic mortality that we live with in the profound majesty of everlasting life with him and in a glorious new creation. Friends, that is the true message of Christmas. That is the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing less than the sure and certain promise of a whole new creation filled with the restored beauty of human life, recreated in the image of God, repossessed by God our Savior forever. And that restored life can begin now in this present age. That's what Paul's saying here. Salvation has begun for all who are in Christ, all who have entrusted their future to him. He says elsewhere, wherever anyone is in Christ, already there is new creation. Already those healing wings, those purifying wings of his grace are, are penetrating the darkness of our lives with the new rays of dawn. The moment anyone gives their life to Jesus Christ... There's an invasion of his heavenly light. The transformation of heaven has begun in that person's life. That self-possession gives way to God's possession. And just so, the pollution and the pain gives way to purity and to purpose. And lives of fruitlessness and futility become lives of fruitfulness, lives of fulfillment, even now in this dark world as we wait for the coming of the Savior because we're back where we belong. We're no longer in bondage to our own disastrous self-rule, but we're gladly bowing the knee to his beautiful divine rule over us. That's just what it means to be a Christian believer, to be back under the control of the only one who knows how to lead our human lives. Of course, there's a long way to go. But like a sick man who's had the abscess, the, the source of his sepsis cut out of his body, the decisive intervention is done. 
and he's convalescing, he's awaiting full restoration to health and strength. But the restoration has begun. And the restoration of our world has begun. It began that first Christmas when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared to bring his salvation to human beings. It's begun for our world, but it can begin for you and your own human life this Christmas. If you will let go of the disaster of lawlessness, the folly of imagining that you can be God over your own life, and instead if you grasp hold of your true destiny, true life as God's possession, to be shaped forever in his image, his way, and reshaped in beauty and love that will be everlasting. Do that and his beautiful restoration will begin right now as his purifying light will start to penetrate your life. It'll penetrate your mind, your heart, your whole being, bringing cleansing, bringing wholeness to your thoughts, to your words, to your deeds, to your relationships in life, to every part of your life you'll begin to see the beauty returning as the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ within you teaches you the way of his grace, leads you, as the apostle says, to renounce ungodliness and to live a godly life in this present age as you wait for that blessed hope of the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And on that day, friends, if you have believed and trusted in him, when he returns, you will see him as he truly is in all the beauty of his glory, and you will be like him. You'll be restored fully and forever to a life of meaning and of purpose and of nobility and of grandeur and of beauty beyond anything that you could ever have hoped, anything you could ever have dreamed was possible, but will be real and permanent forever and ever. Because Jesus Christ came into this world to bring that legacy. Christmas is all about the restoration of human beauty. The restoration of our lives. The restoration of this whole cosmos. This whole creation for all eternity. Don't let the beauty of Christmas pass you by. The Apostle Paul says... Give yourself to him, the one who gave himself for you. And you will share in that transforming beauty, both now and forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may so hear them read, mark, and learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and the comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, our closing carol reminds us that the message of Christmas is the fulfillment of God's unshakable plan from eternity, now fulfilled for all eternity, because it was there deep within the Father's heart that love issued in decree that sons of earth, though lost in sin, his royal heirs should be.
do have a seat. And just before we close, let me uh, tell you that uh, if you're here uh, as a visitor and if uh, you've never yourself really read through as an adult even just one of the Gospels of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, to engage with the story of Jesus Christ, with his words, with his message, with his actions. Let me encourage you to do that. We have these special uh, edition books of John's Gospel called The Word One-to-One. It's just the Gospel of John uh, in several uh, little books like this, and it's been arranged uh, particularly so you can read through it one-to-one with somebody else. If you come along with a Christian friend or, or family member, then uh, I can assure you they would love to do nothing more than just to read through John's gospel with you. And uh, the first chapter of this to read through together will only take you about 45 minutes, uh, perhaps even less, perhaps just half an hour. It begins with a, a summary of the gospel and then goes right through uh, telling the whole story of Jesus. So if you'd like to do that, just speak to the person who came with you. They'll get you one of these. We've got some of them uh, at the doors on the way out. And uh, have a coffee with them and just invest 45 minutes to see how you get on just with the very first little section of John's Gospel. And if you find you'd like to do more, then I'm sure your friend would love to meet up with you again and continue to read through. A very, very small investment of your time, but something that might well turn out to be worth more than all the rest of life put together. The word one-to-one, John's uh, Gospel. Let me commend that to you. We'd love to see you tomorrow at our uh, Christmas morning service at 11 a.m., Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Do stay behind for uh, refreshments downstairs, mulled wine, mince pies, and so on. And let me wish you a very, very happy Christmas. Just before we part, let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious God, who came into our world that we might know you and that we might find you as God our Savior through Jesus Christ, our great hope, May every one of us this evening, we pray, having heard your words of hope and of beauty, put our trust in you and live under your gracious rule every day for the rest of our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.